السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام So tonight I've been asked to speak about uh, Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi. Um, so I'll start by giving a short preamble just about who the, the background of his ancestry and how they got to where they were. So Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi, uh, Al Khattabi Al Idrisi, was uh, a Sharif from uh, born in Mustaghal in present day Algeria. Um, in the year uh, 17 in the 1780s, uh, 1787, um, and he passed away in 1859. Um, and he was born to a family of Sharifs from the Idrisids. And if anyone knows who the Idrisids were, they were uh, descendants of Imam Hassan, the son of Imam Ali. Um, and their ancestors had their ancestors had basically fought in a rebellion which ended up with the end of the Umayyad dynasty. And the Abbasids had fought side by side with them because they're cousins. They're both Bani Hashim, the descendants of Imam Hussein and the Abbasids were all cousins from the Bani Hashim clan of Quraysh. And they fought because they felt there was oppression done by the uh, Umayyads, especially against the Prophet's family. Um, as soon as the rebellion succeeded, the Abbasids took control of that rebellion and turned on the descendants of Imam Ali and massacred the family that had started the rebellion. Uh, so Idris, the, Idris, the son of Abdullah al Kamil, the son of Hassan Mutanna, the son of Hassan al Sibr, the son of Imam Ali, fought in a second rebellion just outside of Mecca in Fakh, and there he's lost his uncle. He had lost his brother and father, his brothers and father, and he went off to Morocco. And in Morocco, he founded another. He founded the Idrisid dynasty of Morocco. So this was the first Sharifid dynasty of Islamic history, first dynasty founded by one of the descendants of the Prophet. And the city of uh, just outside the city of Valopez, just uh, outside what's present-day Meknes, is a place called Zahun, or also called Mawla Idris, and that's where he founded his first capital. And from his descendants came Mawla Idris II. So um, Harun al-Rashid, when he heard that this dynasty had founded another line and you know, had carried on in Morocco, he sent someone to poison Idris I and uh, he died from a poison that was given to him in a perfume bottle. Um, and his son became the first king in, in history to be crowned when he was in his mother's stomach. So they literally laid her down and put the crown on the stomach and crowned him before he was even born. And they called him Idris II. Uh, from Idris II's line are many, many great luminaries of Islamic history, amongst them uh, Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, who was an Idrisi Hassani, uh, Abdul Salam bin Mishish, another Idrisi Hassani, Abu Hassan al-Shadli, another Idrisi Hassani, Mulay um, al-Arabi Dirqawi, the founder of the Dirqawiyah, another Idrisi Hassani, um, Ahmed ibn Idris, the founder of the Idrisi Tariqa, the Ahmadiyya Idrisiya, another descendant of uh, Mullah Idris. And the person we're going to speak about today is another one. He's, his name is Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi, Al Khattabi al Idrisi al Hassani. He was, uh, he was born in Mustaghanim. His father passed away when he was very young. He was a baby when his father passed away. Um, and his grandmother took, took care of him because she was a scholar. And then his paternal auntie took care of him, and she was another great scholar from his family. His family were all scholars throughout history. There were scholars and da'iyas and people of worship and ascetism and so on, and dhikr. Um, so one of his aunts brought him up, and she was a scholar who the scholars of um, the scholars who work in the judiciary would actually go and have lessons with her in her house. So she'd drape a curtain, and they'd stay, stay on the other side of the curtain, and she would give them lessons. Her son and her husband were also scholars and he studied the different narrations of the Qur'an from her son and her husband. So they were like uh, scholars of quite a lot of repute because they weren't just learned in jurisprudence, they were learned in the Qur'an but not just in one recitation but the different canonical recitations of Qur'an. So he studied that with them. Then he went, to, he went on to other cities in Algeria. And then he travelled to Fes, the, the capital second capital of Morocco after Zarhud, founded by his ancestor Mullah Idris II. And there he studied in the oldest, 
existing university in the world today, the Qarawiyyan University, also founded by Mullah Idris II, where well, one of his courtiers, um, Fatima al-Fahriya, actually founded it, but she was one of his court. And there he studied for a number of years until he was given his licenses to become a teacher and he started to teach in the Qarawiyyan after he graduated. While in the Qarawiyyan, he studied with uh, Tayyip ibn Kairan, who was a student of one of the great luminaries of Islamic jurisprudence and of an encyclopedic scholar. He was a student of uh, Tawud ibn Saud al murri who the great uh, Murtada Zabini said was the crescent of the West, of the Muslim world. He called him the crescent of the Maghrib. So Tayyip ibn Kairan was a student of his and Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi studied under him. He also, while he was studying, he also went and met people of the inner sciences, so people of dhikr. Um, amongst them he met uh, Mawlai al-Arab al qawi who was alive at the time. He met uh, Ahmed ibn Ajiba, famous for his tafsirs, but also another man of great inner illumination. He also met with uh, Ahmed Hijani, who was also an Algerian like him. Um, and they were both in Fes at the same time, so they spent time together there. Uh, after time in Fes, he went off to Egypt and there he met Al Sawi and uh, Amir al Sadir, uh, who were both great scholars of Al Azhar. And then he spent some time traveling around the countryside of Egypt. And also, obviously, as he was traveling from Morocco all the way across of East West North Africa, he traveled through Algeria, back into Algeria, his native land, then into Tunisia, then into Libya, then into Egypt. And then he wanted to do the Hajj after he'd spent some time in Egypt, so he went on the pilgrimage to Mecca. And in Mecca he met another great Idris, Ahmed ibn Idris, who was a reviver of the sciences um, and called people to obviously stay within the methodology of the scholars of fiqh in how you extrapolate rulings, but also to extrapolate rulings straight from primary sources, because he was very learned in hadith. And Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi was very affected by him. He was himself also a muhadith. Um, and when Ahmed bin Idris migrated to Yemen, he spent some time with him in Yemen. My, Ahmed bin Idris migrated to Sabi in Yemen, and his great-grandson would also find a kingdom in the south of Yemen. It's interesting because Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi's grandson would also become the first king of Libya. So his sheikh's grandson would become a king in southern Arabia and in northern Yemen in a place called Jezan. And Muhammad bin Ali's grandson would become the first king of Libya. But Muhammad bin Ali went back into Mecca and there he founded Zawiyas in Mecca, Ta'if, Medina. And then he traveled back into North Africa and by the time he got to Algeria the French had already taken over his native Algeria. And he wasn't really able to go back because anyone of his repute was someone the French authorities would keep under um, surveillance, one, or maybe he'd be threatened because they'd be worried he could start a revolt against them because of the man's charisma, the man's leadership qualities, and the fact he was a scholar of repute. So students would gather around him because he was an Algerian who traveled all around the world and then come back to teach. So he wasn't able to settle back in Algeria. So he went into a neighbor in Libya and in the city of, in a city in the Green Mountains in, in Libya, there are also descendants of Mullah Abdul Salam al Mishish. So another line of Idrisids who had settled there four centuries earlier. And he made contact with them because they're cousins. Yes. They're distant cousins, but they're cousins. They're both Idrisids. And they asked him to found a Zawiyah, which was a place of learning. And he founded the first Zawiyah he founded in Libya was in, in their city. It was called the White Zawiyah. So they called the city Bayda in Arabic because it was whitewashed. And the city to this day is still called Bayda, the White City, yeah, the whitewashed city. Um, so he founded his first Zawiyah there. And from there he managed to penetrate where no other, no many other scholars had managed to penetrate. And most of the Sufi tariqas in North Africa were on the coastal lines and in the big cities, in the caravan routes, in the cities. They were urban. But there weren't really tariqas that had penetrated amongst the Bedouins, especially in Serileka, which is strongly Bedouin. The eastern part of Libya has a very strong Bedouin presence. Uh, there were Bedouins who settled there from Arabia and had kept their culture and so on, but the tariqas hadn't really penetrated. 
he managed to penetrate into the, into the Bedouin heartlands. And the Bedouins had tribal conflicts that had lasted for generations sometimes. They'd had blood feuds for generations where tribes don't talk to other tribes. There'd be no intermarriages between them. And what he did, he founded a Zawiya in every tribe's land. Because of his repute, they, want, they gave him land to set up a Zawiya, and he did. And he started by teaching the children of, he, he had his students teach the children of each of these Zawiyas the Fara'id Ayn, the, the compulsory sciences. And also initiated them into Tasawwuf. But then the cream of those students would be taken to the Zawiya of Baida, and then the mother Zawiya transferred from Baida to an oasis town called Jakub. And there he'd take the best of the students and he'd teach them not just the Fara'id Ayn but the Fara'id Kifayat. So they would become scholars in their own right. And in the Zawiya, in the, in the Zawiyas, they also studied carpentry, other crafts, leather work, book binding. They did agriculture, they studied horse riding, they studied uh, martial arts. Uh, they had windmills to grind wheat and corn. They had mills that were turned by animals. They were self-sufficient and he built them from the coastline all the way down into the caravan routes in the interior of the country. Um, what, what he wanted was students who could be self-sufficient, um, could be were very learned in the sciences, so that they could do the work that he, they could continue the work he wanted to do, which was to s spread Islam into areas where Islam hadn't really penetrated because of the politics of its kings and the interseen politics between different tariqas and different groups of scholars. He wanted to penetrate into the heartlands of sub-Saharan Africa where he felt the Muslims had fallen short. Um, but the beautiful thing that he did in the mother's area was when these children of the different tribes came to study to become scholars in their own right, he made them brothers. And then he would send them back to the Zawiyas to teach, but he wouldn't send them back to their own tribe Zawiya. He would send them to the Zawiya of a tribe that had a conflict with them, to break the conflict between the tribes. And the, what the Sunusi also wanted to do was, he inculcated in them that it was more important to learn the sciences than to become a devotee, which was the understanding of the early community. That sometimes you can become someone who does a lot of worship, but you don't know much, you don't have much knowledge. And they felt that you could get closer to Allah by learning because your learning could be a benefit to others, whereas your worship was only of benefit to you. But at the same time, you were expected to act upon what you, what you learned. So this was the understanding of the early community, like Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal said. He said, I don't know if anyone could be called a student of knowledge if he doesn't stand up at night and pray. He considered standing up and doing night vigils as a mark of a student of knowledge. He said, I don't know how a man could be a student of knowledge and not get up and pray. And there's a famous anecdote which was that Imam Shafi, who was a teacher of Imam Ahmed, came to stay with Imam Ahmed in his house in Baghdad. And his daughter had heard a lot from her father, Imam Ahmed, about Imam Shafi. That he was a pious man, he was a godly man, he was a saintly man, he was a very learned man. So she was watching him eating. And then when he went to sleep, she watched what he did. And in the morning she went to her father and she said, this teacher of yours isn't all that, is he? And she says, he says, what makes you say that? She said, the way he was eating, he, he, he didn't stop. And then she said, and, you know, you put, you put a, a, an earthenware vessel with water outside his room so he could do wudu at night. She said, I checked it in the morning, it was still the same. He, hasn't, he didn't wake up to do qiyam al yeah. And then she said, he said to her, let's go and ask him what happened. And they went and asked him, and she said, my daughter has some questions for you. And yet she asked him, he said, he said, well, the food of the righteous has barakah. So I didn't stop eating because of your father. He's a righteous man. This is even though Imam Shafi is the teacher of Imam. He's still eating at a student's house. And then he said, and, and he said, as for last night, he said, I didn't need to renew my wudu because I didn't sleep. After we talked, there were things that I was thinking about that I stayed reflecting on all night. So I got up. I prayed with the same wudu I had for Isha. So this was Imam Muhammad bin Ali's understanding that to create real men of Allah and real women of Allah, you needed people who were learned and practiced what they knew, but you needed learning. And he used to say, beware, beware, beware of any shaykh that makes you do without knowledge, that makes you renounce knowledge. You know, some people start saying, you know, I'm, I'm just a pious devotee and Allah will give me knowledge and 
inspire you and so on. He, he said, beware of that kind of talk. Um, and one of the things they did was they actually used to pray with the fourth prayers, which are 70 rakahs altogether. If you added the sunan of Qiyam al-Layl, Duha, and the sunan before the Duhr, before Asr, before Asr and after Duhr, they amounted to 50. They did 50 sunan on Qiyam al-Layl. Because the Prophet was first enjoined to do 50. And if you count the sunan the Prophet actually did, he did about 50 rakahs a day, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though the fourth was five. So that they continued this kind of practice. Um, by the time he passed away, his son and many other scholars were left behind him to take the mantle. And by the time his son became a teacher and the circle of students that Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi had taught and his students had taught were now ready to go off to do da'wah. And they went into Chad, they went into Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, the Ivory Coast, Senegal, Gambia. And that's why if you go into these parts of the world, you'll see that if you see what the traditional Libyan clothes look like, their clothes in Gambia are very similar to the traditional Libyan clothes because a lot of Da'is came out of Libya into those parts to do da'wah in sub-Saharan Africa because that was the vision and the dream of Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi where he felt the Muslims had fallen short. And if you look at even the great uh, Ibrahim Nyas of Senegal, his ancestry came from Baybal the city of Beda, where the first Zawi of the Sunusis was founded. His ancestors migrated there around that time into Senegal. Um, so he, was, he, he had Libyan ancestry, basically, and one of his ancestors married a queen from Senegal. That's where the Sisi, uh, not Sisi, sorry, Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas, that's where the Nyas name comes from, the princess he married. But their ancestry actually came from Libya. Um, and by the time his son, was, was the main sheikh and had matured into his position. There were four million students of the Sunusiya in Sub-Saharan Africa. And when the French came first, they came with Jesuits to take control of Sub-Saharan Africa. They sent Jesuits in first. And they realized that with the Sunusis, these weren't just uh, pious devotees. These were learned men who the community congregated around and crystallized around. And you couldn't just come with a missionary, just missionaries from the Jesuits to convert these people. They had too much learning. They were inoculated against those ideas. So the French resorted to basically coming by force. They brought French forces into Senegal, Ivory Coast and so on. And then they just started destroying everything they found in their wake. And the Sunusi Zawas was one of the first things they would take out and they massacred everyone they brought. And then the French basically said, we need to actually take control, go to the mother Zawiya in, in Jahbub and destroy that. And the Zawiyas in Kufra and the southern Sahra where, where they sent their missionaries into Chad. And um, what happened was, as some of our brothers in the Cameroon and other places lost their land to the French, they actually fell back into Libya. So there's families from, whose ancestry came from Cameroon and other places because they, their ancestors fell back to Libya to fight and they stayed there afterwards. Um, and if you know the famous Omar Mukhtar, the Lion of the Desert, who most of you would have seen, he was a Sunusi. His father was a student of Muhammad bin Ali Sunusi and he was a student of his son, Muhammad bin Ali Sunusi. And just to give an idea of what kind of people these were, um, this was a man who in his 70s, fought the, Fred, fought the Italians over 180 skirmishes. That's about three a day if you average it out, in his 70s. And yet he was still completing the Qur'an every seven nights. Every seven days he was doing a khatam of the Qur'an. And the way they do the khatam of the Qur'an, they, they use the, a mnemonic, Fami Bishok. So, Fatiha to Maida, Maida to Yunus, Yunus to Bani Israel, Bani Israel to Shu'ara, Shu'ara to Wasafat, Qaf to the end of the Qur'an. That's how they divided the Qur'an every seven days. And Ahmad Zarruq says in the Nasih al-Kafiyah, this was the way of the early community. Some of the Sahaba who did the Qur'an every seven days, this is how they divided the Qur'an. And uh, Ahmad bin Allan al-Siddiqi, in his commentary on Sahih al nawi says this was the way that they used to divide the Qur'an, if they did it every seven months. This was one of the ways they divided the Qur'an. Um, so this was how they were. Their main thing was Qur'an and 
that's still a culture that is still to be found in Libya, where they say Libya, I think, per head has more Quran hafiz than anywhere in the world. It's, it's the land of a million hafiz. There's six million people in Libya, a million of them know the Quran by heart. And most of them still study the old way, which was on the wooden boards, because they say it's, it's better for memorization. Um, so they've left them and Sidi Abdul Salam and Asmar and others left this legacy behind of really focusing on the Quran and focusing on Salawat on the Prophet and emulating him inwardly and outwardly until some of them experience visionary experiences of the Prophet But why the Quran was so important to them? Because the Prophet was the walking Quran. The, the Prophet came to teach the Quran. He was the walking Quran. He was the exemplar of the Quran. He was the one who gave us the call. He explained what the Quran was to us. So they felt it was important to emulate the Prophet inwardly and outwardly and devote yourself to the Book of Allah. Yeah. And if you had other time, they did a lot of salawat on the Prophet وسلم, because they felt this would open the person inwardly. And this was the way of the, the people of, of uh, inner insight um, from the time of Ahmad Zarruq who said that most of the parts are now closed except the part of saying salawat on the Prophet. And there's a hadith of the Prophet where he says, the closest of you to me on the day of Qiyamah would be the ones who do the most salawat on And in another hadith he said, the closest of you to me on Yom Al-Qiyamah would be the ones who have the best character, the best akhlaq. So some of them have understood that. So he's saying, salawat on me, the most salawat, you'll be closest to me. The best akhlaq, you'll be closest to me. So they understood that salawat on the Prophet actually affects your character. Because as you do more salawat on the Prophet, you love the Prophet more and more. As you love the Prophet, you become drowned in thinking and reflecting on how the Prophet was. So it will change and, and start impacting your inner, in your inner character. And also the light of Salah on the Prophet will change you because Allah says, It is he who sends Salawat upon you to, to take you from darkness into light. So the Salah of Allah on us is light. Allah gives us light and illumination by doing salawat on us. And the Prophet said, whomever does one salah on me, Allah does ten on me. So every time we're doing salawat on the Prophet, we're being passed in an ocean of light. Jazakum Allah khair. If I haven't gone on for too long, if there's any questions, please do. How do you make salawat on the Prophet? There's different uh, formulas of doing salawat on the Prophet. You just, uh, unless if you have a teacher, you can ask them. If you don't, then there are books written um, on salawat on the Prophet. Um, some people like to focus on one form of salah. Some people like to do the salah Ibrahimiyah that we do after Tashahud. Some people like to do that. Some people like to do other salawat that they found shorter, like the salah Anasi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyid Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam. Or Allahumma salli ala Sayyid Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam. Some people like to do longer field formulas of salawat. Um, one of the great scholars of Morocco, Fes, uh, Imam al-Jazuli, wrote a whole book on salawat on the Prophet called Dala'il al-Khayrat wa Shabarak al-Anwar. Salah ala Nabi al-Mukhtar. Now that whole book, he divided this, there's multiple ways to divide it. Some people read the whole book from beginning to end in one day. It's about 200 pages. Salawat, hundred something. Some people divide it into seven. So the usual divisions, if you buy the published volume, it's seven. And there's a way to do it every three days. So it's whatever time you have to allocate. Um, but some people do it every seven days. When they finish, they start again. Another seven days. And it really does have an effect. As a person, after you've done it for a little bit of time, you, you feel that there's a difference in your life. And you feel it's very hard not to continue. Whether you continue by doing salat the al khairat or whether you continue by doing a lot of salawat in other ways, depends. But you will feel a difference in that and you won't be able to stop. Sure. Yeah. And some of the great scholars actually say, sorry, they say that uh, the salah of the Prophet is the shaykh of the one who has no shaykh. century, 18th something, and, and late, late 18th century, late 19th century as well. Yeah. So they, uh, by the time they, 
By the time they got into Chad, the Sanusis had moved their Zawiya from the mother Zawiya in Jakub, which is just south of the Mediterranean coastline of Libya, in an oasis. They'd moved their Zawiya to a place called Al Taj in Al Kufra, near Fazan, which is in the so southern desert of Libya, deep into the southern desert, because it was closer to Chad than Sub Saharan Africa, because they had to take their, the, the Sanusis, basically, all of them congregated there to go into Sub Saharan Africa to help fight the French. The French were taking over Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and so on. Omar Mukhtar's first battles weren't against the Italians, it was against the, Ch the French in Chad. And if anyone knows like, uh, the, the tribes and the tribal history of those lands, it's, there's no borders. You know, the, the, like if, you go to, if you go to northern Chad, north, eastern Chad, the tribes there are called Awlad Suleiman. Well, it's southwestern Libya, or that Suleiman. It's the same tribe. You know, you have, you know, the Tuareg on the other side. It's Tuareg going all the way there to Mali. It's from Fazan in Libya all the way to Mali. It's Tuareg territory. So there, there weren't really these borders. Um, the, the tribes, and, and even in linguistics, they know there's a linguistic continuity. If you were to start a Chinese whisper in Scandinavia, it would reach Italy perfectly fine, because someone on the border would know two languages. Remembering him, there's two kinds of remembering him. There's, there's when you do it with your tongue, yeah. but even if you act according to his character, you live according to his way of life, that's remembering the Prophet. So, not, not according to his life, but remembering the Prophet is two salawat. So, isn't it important to remember Allah and see what but when you remember the Prophet Muhammad, what do you remember him? Allahumma, salli. You say, oh Allah, send prayers upon the Prophet. Allah says to you also in the Quran, inna Allah yusallu Allah wa malaikatu yusallu na ala nabi ki ayyuhu ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallam taslim. He made it one of the markers of the believers. That they said salawat on the Prophet. But you can't do salawat on the Prophet without doing dhikr of Allah. Yeah, because the name Allahumma, according to some, is one of the greatest names of Allah. You're mentioning Allah every time you say the Prophet's name. Yeah. It's also one of the meanings, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ In Surah Al-Inshirah. How did Allah, Allah raise the Prophet's remembrance by making his remembrance tied to Allah's remembrance? When you say Muhammad, is it just Muhammad, my brother? It's Muhammad who? Rasulullah. And in the Shahadatain, his name is attached to Allah's name. You can't, you can't even enter Islam without saying the second part of the Shahad. That's what one of the meanings of Rafa'anadakadikrak. Your remembrance is tied to my remembrance. But there's no real way to do remember to do salawat on the Prophet without remembering Allah, so you're still doing the of Allah. And those people, when we talk about them, yes, they did the of Allah as well. They did istighfar, they did la ilaha Allah, they did a lot of these things. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك من تسوى ما ظلمت نفسي فاغفر لي ذنوبي فإن لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك عمل تسوى ما ظلمت نفسي فاغفر لي ذنوبي فإن لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك عمل تسوى ما ظلمت نفسي فاغفر لي ذنوبي فإن لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت